Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host, Coach Jason Coop, and this episode of the podcast is with one of our very own coaches, and that is Sarah Scazzaro. Sarah has been absolutely instrumental and helping not only me, but our entire coaching department out specifically with how to properly strength train with all of these endurance athletes that we have. Sarah has a very specific strength and conditioning background as well as a corrective exercise background. She also helped me design most of the strength training chapter within the second edition of Training Essentials for Ultra Running, which is out there. You guys go and check it out, get your hands on it if you do not have it already. And since this is the time of year that athletes everywhere are getting back into the gym, gym memberships are flying off the shelves, everybody's cramming in there. We wanted to answer some of the most practical questions that you guys have out there in the audience. So we took some straw polls on Instagram, on Twitter, and we brought them into this conversation that really centered around how do you start? If you are a reasonably well-trained and have some strength training experience, but maybe not have strength trained over the course of the last several months, how do you actually start? What things should you go do in the gym? How should you set up your strength training program to kick it off on the right foot? That's the thesis of a lot of what Sarah and I talked about throughout the course of this podcast, but I don't want it to end there. I do want to build more podcasts off of the strength training theme because it is one of the most popular ones that I get questions on Instagram and out in the field every single day, every single week. So expect more from the strength training theme from the Coopcast in 2022. I think this is going to be a big part of the content that we put together. But enough of that. I'm going to get right out of the way. Here's a conversation all about how to start your strength training with coach Sarah Scazzaro. So you and I, we did this kind of like, you know, ad hoc straw poll (laughs) advance to kind of get ready for this. And I don't even think we needed to do it because we kind of knew what the results were going to be. I'm always flabbergasted when we ask people about strength training because ultimately the questions that are the questions that kind of get filtered back to us are hyper specific. Yeah. Like really, really, and I know people want, they want to know what the thing is like exactly for them, but for whatever reason, it's strength training. It just seems to like this, like hyper specificity is even more enhanced. And I've never been able to like place why that is. (laughs) Why is that? I don't know if it's because there's so much out there and trying to like distill it down into like, what do I need to do? Or if it's the, um, the secret sauce. Like there's gotta be that one thing once I unlock it. Cause isn't that what every athlete's hoping for the The one one thing thing. or the one exercise. And I think strength training is just so much more broad. It's just, it's not ever just one thing, right? It's, I think that that's it. I think because it is so broad, I've said this before and I kind of made mention of this in the, in the book, if you, if you remember, right. Mm -hmm that we put, we cast this overly broad umbrella across it and it can encompass anything from a one rep max Olympic lift, right? Yeah. Like you would see in the Olympic games where, you know, they've got, you know, way more weight than you and I can lift on, <laughs> on the end of those bars <laughs> to physical therapy exercises with the band. Yeah. And you know, there's a very, whole, very lightweight. It's interesting too. Cause like you, if you spend even five minutes on social media, then you'll get into the the different arguments of not they won't consider any of that ladder stuff. That's not strength training, you know, unless yeah. it's hard heavy weight. So it's you have all these conversations going amongst all these different populations, and nobody can even necessarily agree what they want to have be under the umbrella of strength training. What's <laughs> do, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like does that count? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know. At least ultra running, I think most of us can agree. If it's over a fifty k, then it's check an ultra marathon. Um, but strength training yeah. is just so does that count? And I think sometimes people get kind of caught up in that, the details of that, of rather focusing on maybe whether it's beneficial or not to the runner. Yeah, for sure. And 
the voc- I don't know. This is my own hang up. So oh, <laughs> we'll go for it. The soapbox eventually. <laughs> Do it. But the vocabulary irritates the crap out of me because yeah. I I can't tell you how many conversations I've been in with people where we're talking about strength training, and it takes like ten or twenty minutes to like figure out that we're talking about two wildly different uh imaginations in our mind yeah. about what that strength training is yeah. i'm talking about going in and doing you know three sets of five or something and somebody else is going in and doing olympic lifts and the other person is going in and you know using you know monster walks and things like that your it's just, favorite you know my yeah. favorite exercise favorite. we're gonna talk about that too yeah but, but it, it's just the voca- the fact that all three of those can kind of mean the same thing mm-hmm. it that's just that's just i don't know i just can't get over this my own hang up well though. and i think that's part of the confusion and kind of circling back to why do people they like tell me what to do because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so it could be so varied um and those are conversations i have to have with my athletes too because they'll be like well i want strength training i'm like well what what, where are you coming from when you talk about mm. needing strength training? Like, where's your point of reference? Because you may be someone who's only ever experimented with a stability ball and never touched a barbell, whereas someone else could be like, dude, I've done years of CrossFit. And so they're, they're wildly different. <laughs> For sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's get over our own hangups and we're going to get down to like yeah. the practical thing. So I think the way that this conversation is going to get set up is we're both going to kind of offer our own opinions on different aspects of this, right? Both yeah. as coaches in the space, practitioners in, in the space. And some of those opinions are going to be similar and some of them are going to be different. And that's kind of the beauty of everything, right? Yeah. So the, the, the framework that I want to use initially, and it's really good that you already started to paint this picture of where is the athlete coming from? Because you you get painted a lot as the quote unquote strength training coach. And so yeah. when our good friend Dominic, right, our good friend Dominic, our athlete services manager, when he's looking at the incoming athletes and who to match them up with coaches, you're on the top of the list whenever somebody mentions, hey, I, I quote unquote need strength mm-hmm. training. And I'm emphasizing the word need very <laughs> deliberately. We'll come back to that too, I'm sure. <laughs> we're, no, we're going to talk yeah. about it right now. Yeah. We're going to talk about it right now. So you are the recipient of those athletes, the athletes that say, hey, I need or I definitely want one of those two strength training to be an integral component of my training. So the first piece of framework that I kind of want to start out with is does every single endurance athlete need in capital letters, bold font strength training to be a part of their over of their overall run training, or how would you actually kind of grade that and suss that out since you're on the recipient uh, or since you're kind of the recipient of that, of that question a lot. Yeah. So, okay. That the, the emphasis there is on the bold letters, capital letters of need, right? So it's a strong word. <laughs> to, it is a strong word. I think most people can benefit from it, but there's varying shades of that. Right. And we're going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to commit to something here. So I'm not going to dance yeah, around it, but I think a lot of that is what that comes from is, and we talked about this before is what are you giving up in order to make time for that strength training? So if somebody comes to me and when someone's coming to me under the umbrella of hiring me as a coach or hiring anybody else as a coach, and they want to include strength training, they're first and foremost, generally coming to me as I want to complete X, Y, or Z race. This is my, I'm training for Leadville. I'm training for Western States. I'm training for this 50 miler and I need strength training. Okay. So when we set up the architecture of your run training, because that's what our focus is, how do we plug strength training in to be an enhancement of that versus a detractor of that. So if someone's already coming to me and saying, I don't even get five hours a night of sleep. Okay. Adding an extra 30 minutes to an hour of strength training is probably not going to like, where do you have the time for that? If you're not even prioritizing sleep, does that, you know, that so, is right on those, those athletes mean, are poor candidates for monster walks. We're going to pick up because <laughs> <laughs> those are so demanding, those um, are, those are the- but just, it's like, they're at, they want to add more. Like, I, there's somehow this feeling that adding more onto the plate is going to complete yeah. them as an athlete when they're actually neglecting some of the key parts that are going to be more beneficial for them. Um, so now if someone's like, I'm like, yeah, they get everything they need and, and the strength training would be beneficial. I, I do believe it is something that is pretty valuable for, for overall like durability and with some issues with some, you know, some overuse issues with injury, not all, you know, um, 
And I do believe that, you know, within the right context, strength training has its place. But I think someone who is trying to use strength training as the, I'm going to go ahead and say it, the poor man's physical training, physical therapy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not, that's not, you should be going to a physical therapist. You know, I mean, I, I get people that'll ask me like, oh, I have this, what should I do? And I'm like, well, have you seen a physical therapist? No. Okay. Go see a doctor, a physical therapist, get a diagnosis, make sure you know what you're dealing with. Don't just make strength training. Like I'm going to cure myself with this. So it's not, so it's kind of back to the original question. It's not a need, right? You don't need it to complete or to be successful in ultra marathon. You don't need much, right? Yeah. Ultra marathon, <laughs> simple sports shoes, maybe not even shoes. I you mean, really need those, right? Yeah. <laughs> Depending on who you talk to. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, so, but, but, but the benefit, there is a benefit. Yes. I believe and that. that benefit ha and that benefit has a range. I think that's, yes. that's the right framework for things. And that's now, very that individual to the athlete. Yes. Okay. So, you know, me, I don't, I don't let our coaches get away with the right. answer. It depends. Right. right. Yeah. I think that's a cop out and there's <laughs> always an, it depends on, and we should know better on what yep. it depends on. You already mentioned one criteria, right? If other areas will make a bigger difference than strength training, you go from five hours of sleep to six or seven hours of sleep a night, that two hours extra sleep is probably going to do you more than an hour in the gym. Correct. I believe that. What are the other, it depends pieces so that we can kind of like grade the value of strength training for each individual. Once again, this is something you do because everybody comes in and says, yeah. I need it. I want it. You're on the recipient. You're on the recipient end and say, okay, for this athlete, we're going to prioritize it here in the list because of these reasons for this yeah. other athlete. Yeah. Let's, let's wait, you know, eight weeks and get some other things established before we do it. And that whole range of things take, take the listeners through kind of how you're, how you look at that landscape. Yeah. Um, so Absolutely. I'm looking at each individual athlete and when they're coming to me. So if they say I'm training for this event, and then we talk about their training availability, the recovery, all the other pieces that go into that first and foremost, too, if somebody is coming to me, that's been cleared from like a physical therapist, but has been told to work with a coach and include strength training in their routine, then we're going to make that a priority because I've actually been told to, that's is a very impactful thing that could be used for their, for their training. Um, especially someone who has known asymmetries or imbalances, um, working it through some strength exercises could be very beneficial depending on the situation for the individual, depending on. So <laughs> I emphasize that just for That's you. Good. Um, good. So after that, if someone's like, I get eight hours a night of sleep, I have plenty of time for training. I want to, I want to do strength training. You know, they're, they've got the perfect situation, which yeah, yeah. Like we could talk about how often that happens, but, um, I mean, you know, you've got yeah. a big athlete base, you yeah, spit a, yeah. like spitball a percentage of <laughs> how often that happens. Maybe of that perfect, everything being perfect, yeah. less than 50%, less yeah, than 50%. That's, I, that's a, that's a, that's fair. That's I fair mean, that where well. they're getting adequate sleep, their <clears throat> yep, job and work family that's balance. Fair. Yeah. Um, then it's a matter of to use a kind of a, the dosing, like how do we program it, the prescription? How often do we do the strength training, right? To the beneficial for the individual. So are we talking, and again, it comes back to that, what is strength training to each individual? Is it, I'm having them do core work and monster band walks a couple of times a week, or are we doing heavy squats and deadlifting? And that's, I have an opinion of what is best during the, the season for an athlete. I think we talked about that refer to Coopcast versions one and two that <laughs> we talked about. <laughs> well, those, those links will be in the show notes. I'll, I'll mention that in the where, intro by now. Where so. we talked about, you know, when to lift heavy, when to do more moderate kind of mid-season lifting. If someone's coming to me four months out from the event, it's going to look different on how I recommend strength training if they come to me six, seven, or eight months ahead of an event. It's not and what is that like. difference? What does that difference like generally look like? Generally how the, the prescription of reps, the volume reps, sets, loading, exercise selection, um, the needs of the athlete, where their current volume is, if they're up, if they're totally doing awesome with their run volume and recovering well, and we've got the room to put some strength training, but if they have massive deficits in their basic endurance, we need to, that's our priority for their run programming. So when you have an athlete though, for a longer period of time, are you general, and we're going to get into the periodization piece a little bit later. Yeah. 
are you generally like favoring a more periodized strength model with those athletes versus the ones that don't have the the time or the time availability or is it just or does that even come into the fold meaning if i have somebody so we've been together for the past year and starting a new yeah, training exactly. cycle versus someone who's coming to me and we have no like no, I still, there is a, a certain level of, I guess, what you could consider periodization, but it's more of where I know to start the person. So if I've mm -hmm. been working with someone for a year, that periodization is much more organic. It's much more, um, I should say straightforward. We're, we're starting an off season lifting program in December and your race isn't until late August. So we're, so we talk about this a lot in training, right? Uh, we, we design the structure or the architecture of training around two points where the athlete is and where the athlete is going yeah and where the athlete is is like 80 percent of the equation yeah. right because they can only build up so much so fast and where they're going it matters a whole lot more in the last you know several weeks i'll say that specificity um, yeah as we get this, closer on the specificity side of things so let's kind of start it here now you know we're sitting here we're recording this the uh, the end of january Okay. And everybody's got their new year's resolutions. They just signed up for, <laughs> you know, their subscription to the gym that's around the corner. They might've built a gym in their basement, which is what I just did over the oh, holiday season. That was nice. a Christmas present from my wife and I, right? So Aww. we're getting on the, yeah, we're getting on that bandwagon as well. So th there's a, there's a lot of, I guess my point with that is, is there's a lot of listeners out there that are, that are, they, they're starting to wrap their heads around it. They know yeah. they want to try to incorporate some sort of strength training. Where should they start? In terms of reps and sets or exercise progression? Whatever, or, the whole oh. thing. Like, Sarah, where should I start? <laughs> That's not a fair question. When is their event? What is their training history? What, <laughs> what equipment let's do they assume, have? So, okay, let's let's just put some, I, I, I know coaches always hate these things. I hate answering these <laughs> questions too. Let's, let's put some parameters around it just to give you some, some, some go with. They're training for 100K ultra marathon in July. Okay. They have a reasonable training background. They've been training over the winter, probably Excellent. about 70% of what they maximally train at. Okay. So they're coming into, they're not coming into it with like zero fitness, but the strength training component is either new to them okay. or will be recently new to them. Meaning they didn't strength train for the last six months or they haven't strength trained at all since they were in college. Okay. So we're, your prototype. we're six months ish out then from a late yeah. July race. So this is an appropriate yep. time. So as an athlete like that, I'm going to go with that specific situation is someone that first I'd make sure I know what, if they don't have a, do, what is their training history in terms of that helps with exercise selection? Do they know their way around the gym? Do they, are they comfortable? And that's something I ask actually in my intake of how comfortable are you with like squats and lunges and deadlifts? And if someone's like, then that's a different track. Whereas if someone's like, yeah, I, I'm pretty confident or I'll hire a person in, in person person to help me yeah. check my form, which I think is valuable. If somebody yeah. is not sure of their proper form, um, I do a good week or two or three of let's get in there. Let's get moving. Make sure the movement patterns look good. Make sure you're comfortable. Let's see what some of our loading is. Then I would start them in that heavier, heavier phase of kind of that periodized where we're going to start with the heavier loading, um, appropriately, obviously heavy is different to everybody, but they're not going to be right. doing all monster band walks in the beginning. We need to, <laughs> this is gonna, we're gonna, we need to get t-shirts. Um, poor, poor monster band walks. I know you love, I, <laughs> And that's the joke is when I program them, people are like, Coop's favorite, wink. <laughs> I say, wait, we need to explain the joke before. Let's just take a quick sidebar on, on explaining the joke. So the reason why it's funny is, is like, I always feel that this is the de facto exercise that everybody gets for no reason at all, other than the fact that it's like the exercise du jour for yes. runners. Yep. <laughs> And, there's no logic. I, I wouldn't say there's no logic, for, but it's haphazardly thrown around. I guess I that's would agree. I make fun of. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's people find this thing and then that's the thing. And if you do your lateral yeah. bound, you know, your monster band walks, your lateral walks, all your woes will be cured. Plus it's monster, right? It's like, rah, rah, monster. I know okay. we got to give it. A okay. So name. you're, so, so here, here's the thing that's probably surprising to a lot of people. Let's get this back on the rails. You're the initial prescription for you 
is going to be a higher weight, lower rep, right? Heavy types of weights. After a making sure the athlete is comfortable and competent in the gym. So someone who okay. has never touched a weight ever, ever, not even in college, it's probably not the time to start going like, okay, okay now you're going to do back squats and you're going to do them heavy deadlifts. Yeah. Let's do this. So yeah. that was coming from the specific point of the athlete you mentioned. If somebody comes to me and they're like, I don't, I've never even purchased a dumbbell help. What do I do? Yeah. Different, different person, different, a different type. person. Um, also another factor, I feel like it's important to note there is, um, and this is really a big with how I program for my athletes is what equipment availability and access do they have? Are you someone that can go to a gym and have the full array of all the weights? Or do you have two sets of kettlebells or one set of dumbbells in your basement, a stability ball? That's going to, but that's going to look, but does different. that, does that affect the exercise selection and the set rep combo or well, more of one or the other? Both. If you think okay. about it, because there's certain yeah. things that you yeah. can't do with say one dumbbell. And also if, if the point were to go to five reps and you have a 20 pound dumbbell, you're probably not going to get the stimulus for the adaptation we're going for in a truly heavy set, you know, like if we're going for heavy lifting, that's not going to be accomplished with that weight. So we have to work with what the person has. Okay. So that, let's that whittle this, let's whittle this down. Yeah. yeah. No, no, let's, yeah. let's whittle this down because I think, I think by going through this whittling down process, the listeners will identify with one stage of it. Yeah. And, and what I mean by the whittle down is we'll go from the most ideal to like, not the least ideal, but less than ideal kind of situation. Or realistic option for them. Realistic, like where are realistic. They so yeah. Yeah. So you've got your, we've got our prototype, which we would probably describe as a reasonably experienced strength trainer, strength trainer, strength training athlete, <laughs> an athlete with a reasonable amount of strength training experience. There you go. And good and good and good run experience, right? Yes. They have access to the Olympic Training Center behind my house. Yeah. That'd what does that look like when they initially start out with Ball, initially like ballpark? Yeah. Ballpark, like three to five exercises set rep. Combination. Oh yeah. And then we'll yeah. kind of, and then what we'll do is we'll like narrow down the equipment availability from there to paint the picture of, okay, well, I don't have that. So here's what I can do. Okay. Yeah. So generally speaking, um, with that athlete and they have that amazing, amazing setup, they're going to be able to pretty much do anything I I'd like them to do, but we are going to work on a lot of the basics squats, deadlifts, bench press, things like that, because those are going to be the most demanding in terms of the loading and they're furthest away from the volume that we'll be having with the running as that increase. We've talked about that before that, that as one increases, the other has to decrease. Um, that's also an appropriate time for plyometrics. Mm. So you now, have both do the traditional squat bench press and plyo. Not necessarily from one to the other. Okay. Yeah. You can include a plyo at the end, during that session, at the end, during that phase, if, if prescribed appropriately, that is the appropriate time to do it or during that week. Like it doesn't have to be in that session, but within that phase. So that is appropriate kind of against what you think about when you talk about building volume and intensity with running, like we don't increase both yeah, at the right. same time, but yeah. it's a little bit different because that's more of, um, the intensity that goes in with that. We don't want that in the middle of the season. So that's going to be more appropriate. Okay. So for example's sake, pick four to seven exercises and then the set rep combination that you would probably use in that scenario. Okay. So if we're going to go with that and we're going to stick with like our push, pull, squat, hinge, lunge situation. So sure. a push, like an overhead press, a pull, a row, like a barbell row. Um, you've got your squat, you've got your lunge, which you can do with barbell or um, dumbbell that could be done with either one, uh, deadlifting. I don't usually have deadlifting and squatting on the same day. So you'd have those on different days. Those will be your big, your big moves. Yeah. Um, reps, reps and sets here can be anything from one to five reps from one to five sets or one to four sets kind of in that range. So you're doing lower, heavier. Um, now I will say that if I'm starting with an athlete, this is not like week three where I'm like, bang, five by five. Yeah, 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 you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a little bit of nuance. We're building into this. We're getting, making sure the athlete's comfortable, but that's going to be in this time of the year. So if it's right now, athletes that have events later on the year and have the accessibility to this, this equipment, that's more of what their training is going to look like. That's what I'm trying to get at. That's a really yeah. practical prescription that a lot of people can write on the back of their hand right now. Yeah. 
hopefully if they're not driving don't drive <laughs> <laughs> don't drive and ride on the back or if they're running stop and take a note on your phone running. really quick <laughs> yeah there you go stop and take a note on your phone there you go and they can and they can kind of take and they can take it in the gym and if they have a reasonable strength training background those exercises will be quite familiar to them yeah. now a little bit more nuance within the prescription so you're using sets of uh sets of five reps that's are the, those to failure yeah that's a, that's a, is that to failure or, no, that's not a common be... question that we get, right? Yeah. Is that no, to you failure leave... or is that to a certain percent of your per, certain percentage? Of your it's your going to be more of a certain percentage. You always want to leave one or two reps in the tank. I think most people, I I'll find it for you. There's actually a really good, um, somebody put on the Twitters, but it's actually a really legitimate calculation of how to get your one rep, rep max based on kind sure. of what your normal lifting is. Cause a lot of people don't even know what that is. And they're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. So a practical way is, do you have one or two good reps left in the tank? Yeah. That's what I tell. That's what I prescribe as well. Then, then you're at an appropriate level of, of loading. If yeah. you finish yeah. your five, you know, five by five and you're like, whoo, could have done 10 more of those. You weren't loading it appropriately, but if you can yeah, barely, and... barely squeeze out your last rep, then that's not what we were going for. Exactly. In that session. And that's just, just a practical. Like, just like we describe endurance intensity. Yeah. You just get it close. The yeah. nano precision of, am I at 162 beats per minute or 160 beats per minute? That, 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 yeah. uh, level of precision kind of gets lost in the, in the yeah. wash. So Just think of these, heavy, close. yeah. So think of these loads. If you're doing RPE, that's like closer to your nine on some of these lifts, eight, nine. I mean, that's going to be heavier up in that area, but you're not full out VO2 max as much, you know, it's probably some, some could dip into the tens, but I think trying to nuance it's just the best approach is do you have one or two good reps left in your tank then you're loading it appropriately don't get over okay, worried so, about your max your one rep for this we're talking about ultra runners we're not talking yeah. about no, power no. you know what i mean who need to know their yeah. one rep max yeah. so well so i'll tell you i'll tell you that you're leaving 80 percent of the olympic training center gym completely untouched with that prescription which is probably the right the right way to go <laughs> with with an ultra and that's the thing it's it's this is my athlete right my athlete is an ultra marathoner if my athlete were a football yep. player if my athlete were a, a gymnast or an ice skater or something different it might look different depending on the sport but yep. i'm prescribing for my ultra marathoners Okay. So let's take your ultra marathoner and I'm going to be selfish because I'm going to use my home gym I love as it. the example of it. And my home gym consists of a bench. Okay. I'm going to take notes. A yeah, you can write this down. I'm putting Sarah on the spot, by the way. Yeah. So this is, was, none really of this was recognize. planned. <laughs> this is not planned. So if you see the deer in the headlights I do for a, a second. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of times I do elaborate outlines with Sarah. I know I can get away with a real skinny one. So my home gym is a bench, okay, a set of dumbbells that goes from five to sixty-five, I think. Nice. Okay. A few kettlebells. What's your heaviest bands. kettlebells? What's your heaviest uh, kettlebell? Forty-five pounds. Okay. And bands, so okay. you can prescribe me all the monster walks you want. <laughs> So what is, which, and the reason I mentioned that is it's not entirely selfish. So a little selfish, not entirely selfish. That's a reasonable home gym. Some, oh, yeah. some dumbbells, a kettlebell, a band and a bench. Yep. Like, yeah. And if you have a stability ball or stability board, that might be an extra thing. Yeah. But that's a, that's a reasonable home gym setup. So Sarah, same setup. Yep. Normal runner, normal strength training background. They're limited to dumbbells and some bands and a bench. What is that athlete going to do right out of the gate at the end of January? Right out of the gate. This athlete whose ha name happens to be Jason, I imagine. We'll just call him Jason. Sure. We'll sure. call this Go athlete ahead. Jason. Okay. <laughs> is Jason able to use oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> the heaviest end of his dumbbell range? Where is he at in that? Come on, I can, I dumbbell bench press those all the time. Yeah, okay. I'm just can. saying it for like your squats yeah. and your lunges. Where are we? Yeah. Okay. I can pick those. I can pick the weights up that I have. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you mean Jason can? <laughs> the, okay. <laughs> Jason so. can. Jason can pick that amount of weight up. It's not gathering dust. Let's, okay, good. Let's put it that so way. I just have to make sure just because you have it available doesn't mean you can yeah, use very, it. Yeah. Um, very true, true. So that would look different because chances are, um, and this is me assuming a lot. So please correct me if I'm wrong, if sure. you know differently. But for instance, 
if you're doing a goblet squat, generally speaking, for most people, their upper body is going to be the limiter, not their lower body. So when you're holding a weight for the goblet squat, it's not the lower body that you're having a problem with that weight. It's whether or not you can use that. So when you have dumbbells or kettlebells, your grip strength and your upper body is going to limit what you can excess from your lower body. So in cases like that, we have to make sure that we are using a way of holding the weight that allows you to get the most out of the loading for the intended body part. And also that will, that will probably change those reps and sets for you. You're probably going to be doing, and when I say more reps, I'm not talking about, you know, 20 reps, but that's probably going to be in the eight to 12 range, generally three to four rep sets. So you're working around this limiting condition of you can't get the right low, you can't get as high of a load because you can't put for, for a squat at least yeah. because you can't put the bar on your back. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you just and work, you're just working around that. So yes. that's with that exercise, right? So you change the set rep combination for that particular limitation. How's that look down the rest of the exercise set? down the rest of the exercise? If you can challenge yourself. So this is sometimes where I do a periodization. Well, not periodization programming. It's a little differently. So maybe the first exercise is a bench press and your can be pretty challenged with a bench press with the weights that you've got or not. I'm sorry. You only have 60, you have 65 um, pounds. That's not hey, that challenges me a lot. What are you trying to say now? <laughs> You're a runner. Um, get, that was a joke. Runners can be strong. 65, okay. I get five reps out of those 65 Excellent. pound dumbbells so and that's about it. That would be, instead of doing a superset, we might have you do an upper body like that at a say four by six or five by five or something like that, or whatever parameter we've got with a heavier load, allowing you to really push hard and heavy with that exercise, maybe pair it with something lower body that you were going to do more reps with what you've got, but the exercises that we can utilize or the, the loads that we can utilize for the exercises, we're going to do as much as possible with those during that time to get the best, most benefit. But I'll also say, just checking your list here that if the benefit, okay, this is general strength in the beginning of the season, right? Yeah. So we're like core and making sure the body's balanced and we're strong and all of that. But most things that we want to apply the stimulus to get the adaptation, if we want to go heavy and if, if you're at home, it's just fine. We just, that's when you have to manipulate more with the, with the actual time under tension, we call it. So the tempo. You know, and so, so you're instead using of a, other other variables yeah. right, to manipulate so, the load. So instead of a squat, it'll be a three count squat with a two pot, you know, a three mm -hmm. count down, two count pause, one count, you know, get up, you know. So it's like that's you're not using momentum. So there's ways to kind of work around this. So I guess my I'm jumping around here, but my point is for most people, I don't ever want someone to think I only have a set of dumbbells or I only have this. I can't possibly strength trainer, there's no benefit. Well, there, there can be, we just, there is, you just have to do a little bit of flexibility and it's fun challenge. It's just programming. It's just programming. So when you're using, you're essentially using speed or the movement velocity mm -hmm. to manipulate the load, are you trying to keep the set rep combination intact or, or more intact, I guess, is the way to put it. So for example, like we will we use the squat thing for an example, because this is what we're just going through. I normally back squat. I'm just going to the, the athlete. So I Jason. can take it out of my personal deal. <laughs> yeah. The athlete normally back squats 150 pounds, okay. right? They can't, they can't hold two 75 pound dumbbells in their hand to replicate that yeah. with dumbbells. So instead what they're going to do is hold two in the set rep combination is let's just say three by five, right? Three sets okay. of five reps. So instead of doing three by five normal squats with 45 pound dumbbells, which, which, which is what they can hold because mm -hmm. the load won't be enough, they're manipulating the speed of the lift going down slowly, pausing, and then coming back up at whatever tempo Sarah prescribes and still getting close to that three by five combination as opposed to doing three by 12, yeah, which is probably it's... what that athlete can do with 45 pound dumbbells. Yeah. It's just a way of utilizing the weight they have to try to get more of that, of that, that you utilizing the tempo and that velocity and that slowing of momentum to get more out of it. Now, some people would say I, my prescription and my approach would be more of the doing more of the reps with the heaviest load as yeah. possible. It's, it's, 
it's preference and it's also what works best for the athlete. And if they can hold on to those 45 pound dumbbells for 12 reps and where they are in the season, but it's, uh, yeah, starts to get really I, nuanced. I, I, well, I mean, I understand that that kind of like discrepancy, it's kind of like, you're just trying to do, I, I've always, I've always viewed as you're just trying to work with what you got. And at the end of the day, if there, as long as there's some load manipulation, yes. you're probably going to get to a better result. Yes. And as opposed to just doing three by five, the entire year. Correct. Of whatever. Correct. Yep. Yep. And because that's how, how do we get stronger? If you're always right. just doing three by five or, or three by 10, and you never, the goal would be that you can lift heavier eventually you're, you're getting a stimulus. You need to be an adaptation. We need to be able to, that's, that's the hope. But again, in the context of ultra running, why are we doing strength training in the first place to enhance yeah, exactly. our running? Right. Exactly. Be, so if you're going to take that, you know, cause people will, I love social media discussions with people because they'll say, Oh, that's, you know, you're, you're not going to get strong. You're not gonna, they're like, well, but I'm doing this because of this is my sport and this is my focus. Yeah. And this, you know, if your focus is to do that, that's great. But our program is going to look different. It's just going to look different. Let's put a, let's, I, I, let's put a pin in this discussion. What is detrimental? Like what types of strength training would be detrimental to the endurance training? And then how, because I want to, I want to come back to that and I'm going to forget it if I don't mention it to you. So write okay. that down on your sticky note. I'm going to write it down on my, on, on it's a mine beautiful well. mind over here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's keep working down our order of, of, of perfection here. So we had our Olympic training center model. Yep. We had Coop's home gym model. And now yep. you know what I'm going to nothing, right? Nothing. I, I ain't got nothing available, right? Body yep. weight stuff. Yep. So how same person, reasonable strength training experience, what does that person get prescribed? That person is it's, there's really no, that's, you can never say no, there's limited benefit to having someone like that do by three by three or five by three right. sets of pushups they're doing. Okay. So they've done 15 pushups. That's fine. Except that maybe three by 12 or three by 15 or three by 45 seconds or something like that is going to give them more of the challenge and the stimulus that they need is going to give them more of the benefit of strength training. You don't have to have equipment. It just makes things incredibly easier and you can't get certain adaptations without certain amounts of loading. Now, whether that's your own body or if that's an external load, but it's hard to deadlift air. So you have to... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's going to be the audiogram right there. It's hard to deadlift there. What timestamp are we at? 40, 50. Okay. Perfect. But I, so all the benefits that could come with deadlift, and there are many, there are many reasons why we would deadlift. If you don't have anything to deadlift, it, it's hard to get the benefit of the deadlift. Now you can, so, so what can we do to help a so runner? So what can we do? What, so what, what can, can we, we do, do to help? So, and they have no bands. Exactly. They have no bands. No no bands stability, just nothing. nothing. Push-ups. Well, well, I mean, let, let's just start. Let's just say like they don't have anything. If there's yeah. a reasonable, simple, basic set of equipment that you would encourage them to do, go do this because you're going to get 80% of the way. The floor is yours to try to yeah. like uh, knock if, that out. If there are things that they can utilize nearby that are safe to pick up and use, heavy objects. Uh, I've got cats, you know, cat litter box, you know, not the actual okay. box, but the boxes of the litter or yeah. heavy, uh, you know, milk water jugs, get creative, right? But kids, yeah, kids, kids small well children, small dogs, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so never forget that, that those are options. But saying that there's also reverse lunges, squats, wall sits, push ups, dead bugs, bear holds. I mean, there are plenty of other body weight moves that while they won't give the same level of what, you know, in the early season of a five by five programming for strength, they're certainly going to give you good core. You know, if you do things barefoot, you're going to get some good proprioception. If you're doing, you know, balance work, these all have benefits to the trail runner and the, the ultra runner. So they're not for nothing just because you don't have a rack of dumbbells or a Olympic training center. So at that point, you're kind of being non-specific, and I'm trying to put you on the spot here. Put me on the spot. Totally fine. 
yeah it, does it does it really need any specificity to it or can you really just do a bunch of random stuff at 20 reps 15 reps at what and have point? it have it at have it have it had impact i'm trying to get back to like What's the minimal point? prescription. Yeah, 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 exactly. I'm trying to get back to a minimal prescription that'll actually have a quote unquote benefit. And we're going to rack and stack these benefits in a little bit to try yeah. to help the listeners okay. kind of like tease it out in their Give head. Give that context. Yeah. Yeah. But, but is there like, what would that look like if you wanted to try to get like maximum benefit out of somebody who had very, very minimal equipment, like practically, what does that look like? And where are we at in their training cycle? Just same, same. Same, Same at thing. the very beginning. During January, yeah, July type of time frame, they're training for an ultra marathon, reasonable strength training background. I never think, okay, at this stage in training, doing a lot of different things isn't necessarily going to be a detriment, but it's going to be, a, it could be just a time suck, right? Mm, so okay. if you're doing the wall squats and the squats and the reverse lunges and the single leg bridges you're doing. It's like, you're so far away from your volume loading. None of those are going to be taxing enough that they're going to destroy your legs. Yeah. But is it necessary to do all of that from a time perspective? And I can't, you know, the specificity I generally like to look at, are we hitting a front of the body exercise, a back of the body exercise lower for lower body. So like more quad focused, more glute hamstring focused. Are we doing a push or are we doing a pole? You only need one or two, generally one of each of those. And you've got a well, well-rounded program. It's almost like kind of what I'm getting from you is, is you almost have to be more sensitive to your time in that situation because the potential for like a null equation is higher. That, and it's just a, it's, I sometimes think when people lack equipment, they think they'll make up for it and like tons With of volume. <laughs> I mean, but then, but then I know someone listening to this is be like, yeah, <laughs> that's how we roll. But I could totally yeah. also see someone listening to this going, wait a second. It's totally, I see it. People go to the gym and have all these toys. So I want to yeah. overload everything. So yeah. I could see that too. But if you're, if you're lifting, I guess what that non-equipment equation, the one challenge with that is when you are loading appropriately in the gym, you don't need a ton of exercises before you're like, right. yep. Right. But when you don't, then it's just a lot of time where you're just throwing things at yourself yeah. and they don't necessarily have a benefit beyond a certain point. Maybe that time would be better spent elsewhere. That, so that statement Sarah, right there is, is that's the best way to put it. I okay. think that once again, we, we we're all limited on time. Yeah. Every single one of us, that's the hottest commodity that there is out there. And it's non-renewable. Can, you don't get it back. Non, it's you know? non-renewable. Yeah. You don't get it back. Exactly. Yeah. We could try to extend it as much as we want to, but there's still an expiration date. Yeah. And uh, whether you're looking at a daily expiration date or a lifetime expiration <laughs> date. Um, but uh, it, to, when you have unlimited options or it, it sometimes is very easy to let that, to, to let the time kind of escape you. And I think people get in, fall into that trap of, well, I can't do the, the that way. So I'll just do all of the things and somehow I'll just yeah, broad exactly. brush stroke it and I'll cover my bases and yeah. it's not necessary. Okay. So let's try to rack and stack this. Okay. Right? Cause, Oof. cause we get, um, uh, we, we, we have as coaches an unlimited number of interventions that we can use. You just mentioned sleep and strength training, right? Right out of there. Sleep mm -hmm. is an intervention, right? We can yep. use that in an, as an intervention to improve performance, particularly for people who lack sleep. Mm -hmm. We can use strength training. We can use uh, recovery modalities like the Normatec boots. We can use physical therapy as an intervention. We can use nutritional in interventions. We have all of these different things and they all have a time cost associated with them to ping off of our earlier theme. Can't, you mentioned that we're doing strength training to improve our run performance. And I don't want to discount the fact that there are also tangential benefits to yes. strength training yep. outside of the acute run performance. We should not discount those. Mm -mm. One of which be, being always... some people just like to do it. I'm one of those exactly. people. I just love to strength train. So Me too. yeah. And there's, I have no shame on that. Spend five minutes on my, you know, any getting to know me and you'll be like, oh yeah, she likes to run and lift, yeah, you know, me too. and I don't, I, yeah. Uh, but, but I guess my point with that is, is 
we we kind of have to come fund come back fundamentally to our coaches and most of the, most of our athletes are coming to us with the primary goal not the exclusive goal mm -hmm. but the primary goal of improving their run performance for whatever events that they're that they're training for yes we need to be holistic is the word that kind of gets thrown around or more comprehensive about their overall health and well-being as absolutely a role of a coach but we but i think for i think for the i think because we are getting so nuanced in the prescription yeah. and the performance has a lot to do with why we are getting nuanced in the prescription we would be remiss if we didn't start to kind of like kind of practically rack and stack these which is a really hard really yeah. really hard thing really hard thing to do yeah we didn't practice is there this a way this is no we didn't so <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna open the floor up to you right as and i'll pose it i think the easiest way to do it sarah is to pose it as a question from an incoming athlete because this is okay. what we solicited out out kind of in the social media space if i incorporate strength training mm -hmm. how much am i going to improve <laughs> okay so couple ways we can talk about this. I'm, this is not a, okay. We have talked prior about there is a very negligible amount of improvement with running economy when it comes to strength training, right? We've, we've covered that base. So if somebody I would coming, say, can I interrupt you really quick? Yeah, absolutely. Negligible in most normal circumstances. If you're Good. talking about very elite track yes. and field performance yes it, it it could that that negligible turns into monumental so exactly but it is an ultra part. running for the for the average of average to above average just ultra runner someone who's like ultra this is my sport right with running economy as it applies to ultra running so we've we've talked about that i do believe that there is an argument though in terms of percentage, like we, and we talk about this in your book with injury prevention, which I think is why a lot of people come to strength training is I don't want to be injured. I don't want to get hurt. Okay. We can totally come back to that because there's a lot of nuances yeah. there too. Yeah. I do think there is a benefit to the just core overall strength, balancing out weak areas of the body, proprioception, all of these things that can be that strength training can enhance for the ultra runner. Can I put a percentage on that for you at this moment? No, I cannot. I cannot say you work with it's, me. It's an unfair question. <laughs> yeah, I, we work, you work with me and in six weeks, I'm going to improve your running by 10%. I mean, I, it, you can't. And it's also, where is my runner coming from? Is my runner never done anything? Well, like anything, somebody that's never been coached, somebody that's never done anything, somebody that's new to, will see leaps and bounds in their performance and in their, their gain of, um, gosh, I can't think right now. The, but can uh, you put it in, I'll, I'll interrupt you. You can kind of yeah, gather your thoughts. Yeah. Can you even put it in a bread box? No, I don't think you can necessarily. You don't think you can even really, you don't think I mean, what do you mean? Like as an actual box? percentage or like, here's a package yeah. of like, if you strength training, this is what it will give you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. reasonably. Yeah. I think we just, I just covered that of what so that can I, do. Here, here's kind of what I think. I, I think it's between zero and 10%. Okay. Is that what you're giving it? Like okay. if I, if I boil it down to brass tacks, mm -hmm. well, if you screw it up, it's negative, but it's assuming you don't <laughs> screw it off. Let's, <laughs> let's say do. they don't it. And that's yeah. another thing. It's easy to do. It can yeah. be a detriment to your ultra can running. Detriment. Yep. But I think like, so, so people will practically think, okay, if I'm a 24 hour Leadville finisher okay. at the very most it's going to get me two hours that's like the that's the edge of the bell curve right okay. two and a half hours on a 24 hour leadville finish you split the middle of the bell curve and it's like 40 minutes mm -hmm. you go to the other side of the bell curve and it's zilch and it's yep. time it's kind of a time suck at that point maybe maybe i'm being too generous with that one to ten percent but i mean if somebody really tried to pin me down on that question I, once again i'm trying to be fair because it's an unfair question so i'll answer <laughs> it too i think that yeah. that's it and the reason and the reason i say that is is it's not 50%. No, no. And it would be disingenuous unless, to ever tell somebody that it is. Unless, here's the caveat, unless there's something fundamentally from an injury perspective that you're fixing that increases training availability. 
the, those situations outside we're talking about our normal runner they, healthy they just not, got their yeah yep, healthy they yep. just got their gym membership in in january <laughs> they got into leadville they're background. ready to go yeah <laughs> just <laughs> the prototype that we've been talking about that athlete says hey what's the reasonable proposition i want to you know i think strength training will help me with my performance i want to do it there's these other lifestyle benefits what, how's that going to improve my time? I'd give, I, I would feel confident giving them that bread box. And that's a I, big one. That's, I would, I would not put it outside of that limit. Like that to me, I think is very fair. I don't I think, think 10% is a little generous, but <laughs> well, yeah. I know, but <laughs> I appreciate that you gave it that much. Cause I, you know, some people, but I, I agree with you and, and that's not a, a promise or an assertion. I think people should make when it comes to yeah. strength training, you know, of like, Hey, you work with me and I'll get you, you know, by strength training alone, we'll get you to knock three hours off your hundred, you know, hundred mile time. I don't think that's, I don't think here's you can why, do that. Here's why this is important though. We yeah. just talked about all the different interventions. Mm -hmm. What's the cost to getting the benefit from intervention a versus the cost to getting a benefit from intervention B versus yeah. the cost to get intervention C. And so for this case, right, it's a few hours a week, reasonably speaking, right? Two hours, yeah, a couple hours, hour and a half to couple two hours. hours a week. Yeah, yeah right, we'll, we'll give it to two hour and a half to two hours a week <laughs> to get, you know, maybe a few percent, you know, improvement. Yeah. And then you got to weigh that the athlete has to weigh that. And then the coach has to kind of like weigh that out versus yeah. Any of the other things that they could be doing sleep, you mentioned that's probably a much heavier hitter than I would just, one to absolutely. 10 percent amongst yeah. the people that are sleeping for five hours a week. That's probably a 30 percent gain right there, maybe. Yeah. Um, um, people that don't do strength training inappropriately um, during the right time of their cycle can be left too sore and fatigued to actually get the benefit of some of their high quality runs. They're too sore to do their, to do well on their intensity runs. They're too sore fatigued to be able to do well on their long runs. You know, these critical runs, depending on where they are, never run. There's never one critical run, but you know what I'm saying that they just yeah, can't, yeah, yeah. they're yeah. not able to hit the marks on their runs. They're not able to complete them because they're constantly feeling fatigued. There's a, there's a chat. There's a problem there. That's not. Yeah. yeah so I, 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 th this is just a soapbox opinion. Yeah. I think, get, I think getting it, I think getting it right is more complicated than not more complicated but it's just it, it requires a level of precision that i don't think that i think goes underappreciated and what i what i mean by getting yeah. it right is the prescription that we were just talking about set wrap how does that modify throughout the yeah. year and things like that i realize now we're going to have to come back like three months from now and pick up our prototype for when okay. they change phases yep. right <laughs> um but also the prescription in terms of what day during the week oh, yeah. and what time of day are they actually doing that in yeah. order to actually enhance performance as opposed to be as opposed to being a detriment you you started this conversation so let's pull on this thread a little bit okay what are the terrain traps to avoid like what are the things that are going to unwind the training processes as a whole, either from a running perspective or a strength training perspective that athletes should be wary about either when they're starting strength training or kind of as they're going yeah. through it. Um, gym, like gym literacy, comfort, you know, and movement patterns. Like, are you, are you doing a squat appropriately and correctly? Are you doing dead? Like, are can you do the movements? Do you need someone to help you learn how to, because if you're loading, if you can't do a good squat with body weight or under lower, lower loads, you should not be doing heavier loads. You can hurt yourself. So injury, there can be injury that comes from weight training, um, inappropriate loading in the sense that you're going too hard all the time. Um, so you're sore constantly people that do too much intensity. And I hate to pick on this. I'm not going to pick on this, but I'm going to mention it is I see this most often with ultra runners with CrossFit. Ooh, all right. You can throw CrossFit under the bus. I'm not trying to throw CrossFit as a hole like... under the bus, but, but the <laughs> more of... runners who are CrossFitting. <laughs> no. And that's fine. I mean that if they, but that where I think that comes into play, if somebody is very, very good and very educated on a, being able to modify things, being able to know how that fits into the architecture of their training, being able to adjust versus going to these classes, which can be benefit. I'm not, ta I'm talking in the lens of ultra running. Yeah. Yeah. They can be very, very, any high intensity class, CrossFit, whatever you want to call it, can be too intense. And if people are doing this too close to high, high volume sections of their training, that can be very detrimental. Well, 
it could be detrimental. So the mismatch, right? The, the mismatch. high load on top high load, yeah. right? High, tra- high run training load and high strength training. Yeah. If CrossFit is, I, I get why it's, I'm not, again, not knocking. It could be social. It's fun. It's community. It's all these things. But if you're doing it in the two month window before your A race 100 miler and you're not having any concern from mod- modifying the, the loading, there could be a challenge there. It's always maximum load. Right. I think that's the point that you're trying to communicate is typically, typically when you're going into a CrossFit class, I'm not saying everybody does. No. And again, the prototype, the, the, the CrossFit prototype is it's a maximum workout. Every time you step in the box, depending on the gym or the box. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And the coaches, and you can get some amazing coaches, just like anything that, that, yeah, that paradigm is starting to break because the boxes are starting to fall out of love with the CrossFit uh, yeah. brand, which is a good, which in my opinion is a good thing. That's and you've got some amazing coaches that work in boxes that are really good at being able to scale things for their athletes. Yeah. But so I think, it, so going back to my train traps question, right? One of them is to make sure that you're, that, that you're not having a load, ma- a load mismatch where yes. you have high, either high acute meaning on the day mm-hmm. or high chronic run load paired with high strength training load. You need yes. to be able to modulate both of those so that no, so that they're not overwhelming each other essentially. Yeah. I would, that would, that makes sense. Yes. I would agree okay. What that. other, what other, we went through movement literacy, which I think is a big one. Yep. We can let's actually, let's kind of stay on that. Okay. How do people figure that out if they don't, if they've never been in gym before? Well, a good thing to start is to, there's always gyms that have trainers or people that are there that you can start there and asking someone to show you the right movement, you know, how to do it, get a hire a coach for strength, which I know for some people is cost prohibitive. Maybe they can't do that. Mm -hmm. There are some great, amazing resources that you can utilize online. There are great tutorials. The internet is vast. It can be a very scary place, but there can be a lot of good information. Um, I think it's also just knowing where you are, that self-awareness of being realistic with like, if I don't know how to do a, you know, a clean and jerk, you probably should either go get someone, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, don't, don't just like, that looks what a clean and jerk is. (laughs) So don't, don't do that exercise. Yeah. But I, I think utilizing, setting the movement patterns, doing the, the, the groundwork early, getting the good foundational movements, I think is key. Learn the right way. But here's my here's my issue with just go to a gym. I don't trust the personal trainers there. I yes. know a lot of personal trainers and they're I know a lot of really good ones. Yeah. But it's like one to five. Like for every one oh, that yeah. really that I'm really confident in, I can go into any gym anywhere and yeah. one of them is good and five of them suck. Yeah. And then that's where I can tell that I okay. can tell the difference. You can tell the difference. Oh yeah. But somebody who needs who needs who needs uh, coaching with their squat or cueing with their squat. That's a fair. It's not going to be able point. to tell that difference. Yeah. So that's how does pe- how do people how do people navigate that? I, I've I've struggled with this question for forever. Yeah, because if you don't yeah, know no. what you don't know, Sorry, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is good. This is good because it's, you know, with athletes that I have, I always am like, send me a picture of you doing a body weight squat and I can help give you some cues and tell you what you need to wear. So like, I'm comfortable with the athletes that I have that I can help give, you know, I'm not there in person, but I feel very comfortable with giving form checks. But if somebody is not comfortable with that, where do you go when you don't know if you can trust the source for the information? Yeah. What are you, so can we peel the curtain back a little bit on what you're doing with CTS right now? Yeah. I think this is appropriate. So, so Sarah's writing, uh, or designing, I guess is a better word for it. It's not just content. Sarah, Sarah is, is working in collaboration with some of our other coaching staff to basically design CTS's strength training, everything, like how our coaches kind of like learn and prescribe strength training. It's in its infancy. Are, so we're still like, working out the details. It's very, it's very, 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 very early stage, but it is not as, it is not as an, it is not an easy problem because everybody's no. coming to the table with different with a different level of literacy, right? To use that terminology yeah. that, that yeah. we were using earlier. The ultimate goal and correct, or you can add some, you can add some nuance to this if you want to, but the ultimate goal, so, so our coaches are competent in 
prescribing strength training in the same way that they're prescribing endurance training. We our coaches are very competent in prescribing endurance training. Yes. That's kind of our thing, but we have a vast array of competency across the strength training side of it. And, and the goal is, is to, to, to increase that competency within that movement literacy, teaching the coaches to essentially teach movement literacy, which is a whole different thing. Is there any way you can kind of like fundamentally like divulge on how we're going to try to do that? Cause I don't know the answer to it yet. I don't know. And we're still, that's no, I mean, no, that's, it goes to say how hard it is. It is. And I think also too, is that keeping in mind that scope of practice, right? Because yeah. it's like, I can give as an ultra running coach, I can give some nutritional guidance in terms of like race prep and long runs and things like that. And here's some, but I can't ever go as deep as someone like Stephanie who can go right. really deep because that's her scope of practice. It's the same thing with strength for a coach who doesn't have any background in strength or personal training or strength and conditioning. It's probably best for them to be like, Hey, I'm going to use this program that is developed by this coach over here who I trust implicitly that I know is good. Use this versus them programming it themselves. So that's where, that's one aspect of it is having coaches in-house with CTS who we know it's their bread and butter and that their it's their competency and their strength pun, no pun intended, and that they can then pick that off and, and share that plan with their athletes. Now, now, will that coach, if that athlete's like, I don't know how to squat, what do I do? How do I know if my squat looks good? That's where it starts to go. Okay. Well, what do we need to have? You know, cause you can't assume everybody knows how to squat. It's really easy when you've been in a certain, um, field for so long, I've been doing this yeah. for a while now. <laughs> we don't need to say how many years, but when you've been doing this a while, it's easy to forget that, oh, some people, this is all new to them. So, you know, you don't want to forget but that is the point. I think the take home message for the athletes is, is like, being able to teach these movements is not something that many of the endurance coaches out there have as a skill set. I, and I, and I, I can yeah. I, I can confidently say that knowing the landscape of coaches that are out there and you, Sarah, you and I have had so many conversations about this, but it irritates the bejesus out of me when I see coaches working outside of their scope of practice, particularly okay. To, the two things that irritate me the most are with strength and nutrition. Same. And the reason 100%. is, is be, the, 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 the reason is, is the potential for harm is actually real. In yes. Those. Yep. Um, yep. So athletes be wary. Let's, let's, oh, yeah. put, I'm not saying that everybody's bad or anything like that, but, but be wary and when in doubt, go find a second opinion, go find somebody that, you know, is, 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 is used to this stuff and just see if you can match it up. It is a difficult landscape to, it is to, to, to navigate if you're if you're but if you're nervous about if you're nervous about learning the movement patterns or don't feel that you have good resources yeah what then right you go yeah. into a gym you don't trust the personal trainers there you still want to learn how to squat yeah Re so our our there are some good resources on the internet as scary as that can be there are people that know what they're talking about there are some good you know, trainers and specialists and people like yourself, people go to you for ultra, for ultra training. They know that you're like a name in the industry. There are people that I feel are confident. Like this is a good person to, you know, watch or look at. Um, I feel like with enough, if you have the ability and a little bit of patience, there are ways to find people that can help you in your area. If you are in like Podunk, I don't, that's not, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you have no options, well, who can you connect with and just look for people that have certifications from very reputable. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, that's what I would look at. If someone is NSCA or AC, you know, that have these certifications, CSCS. They're, yeah, CSCS or CPT, or they're, they're going to be people that have had to not only have a college degree in order to sit for a test, but they, they take it very seriously. So therefore, hopefully, and this isn't always the case, but hopefully they know what they're talking about. They're more likely to. You know, uh, one of the, I'll give an account out because I like doing it. I have no affiliation with this account yeah. at all, but I think they have really good content is Whiteboard Daily. Yeah. 
um, on Instagram. I'll, I'll link that up in the show notes. Um, and it, it, it's exactly as, as, as described, the whiteboard. it is, yeah. it is, it, it is Instagram posts of a whiteboard, but with stick figures yeah. and how to do all these movements. And if you scroll through enough of them, it, yeah. I mean, I think that that's reasonable guidance. I've actually helped athletes kind of like curate like, okay, we're going to do these movements and here's some examples of what you yeah. can kind of look at using, using those things. But anyway, whiteboard daily. Look, yeah, look no, They're that's a great one. And if I, um, you know, I'm happy to share some more, I can always shoot with you and you can put them in the subject notes too, of if you'd like, or some, you know, resources or I can share. Um, but yeah, good. I like okay. putting me on the spot. We've got our general I like frame. This. We've yeah, we've got our general framework for the people that want to start in January, right? We're going to do generally higher loads. If you've got the Olympic Training Center, a reasonable gym in your background, you have a reasonable set of exercises. If you need to modify them, you can modify the tempo, right? Yeah. Uh, to achieve the to achieve the same load. And then when you get down to the body weight stuff, you just have to be really judicious with how you're going to actually use your time and be very, very surgical with that if you're implementing those things. I promised you a banter question, Sarah, because it's oh, so fun, God. right? And you know where I'm going with this. I did cue Sarah up with this, so barely. I got it this morning, everybody. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Shouldn't need much more than that. Um, I was going to make fun of you if the answer was all in, in, in eloquent or uneloquent <laughs> and all over the board. We were going to make fun of you, but I guess I can't anymore. I really you can. You time. it will okay. still probably be. <laughs> here's the so we so here's the here here's how I can set it up. <clears throat> okay. We typically look at the way to design training for endurance athletes through this lens of what their limiting factors are. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we tease those limiting factors out through a number of different ways. Sometimes we look at a physiology test and we say, oh, okay, the aerobic system is the limiting factor. Or the amount of hydrogen ions that they're generating is the limiting factor or fuel availability is the limiting factor or core temperature is a limiting factor. Sometimes we go out in the field and we ask athletes, hey, what you know, caused you to slow down? You know, was it this, was it that? Did you hurt and things like that? And the latter is more common in an ultramarathon uh, situation than, than the former. We know a lot about the what I would call the traditional endurance sports, cycling, triathlon, track running, marathon running, and things like that, because we can measure to a very, to a very delicate degree what those physiological limiting factors are. And then since we know that, we can train athletes to get better at those limiting factors so they can run faster for kind of whatever whatever given distance. I, I would say we're just starting to tease this out in yeah. ultra running. Um, Guillaume Mie, who has done a lot of work in this area, has proposed an initial piece of framework. And I use that that kind of visual um, in, in my book where he's got you know, VO2 max and muscular fatigue and neuromuscular fatigue and thermal control. And there's probably a dozen different things that kind of go into, into ultra marathon performance. But the thing that I sent uh, Sarah beforehand was this survey that uh, Marty Hoffman and Kevin Fogar did. So for the listeners, Marty Hoffman is the former Western States medical director and has done a lot, a lot of research uh, uh, in this area. It's funny. And part, go, go ahead. I was go gonna ahead, say sir. years and years ago when I was living in California, I actually ran with a group and I got to run with him and had these long conversations with him. And I didn't even realize it was him until afterwards. That was embarrassing. <laughs> it shows up in the research right here. I was like, and, Oh, and one of them, one of them, I promise we'll get done painting this picture before we can kick it back and forth. So one of the pieces of research is he, is he just asked finishers of the Western States 100. And I think it was Vermont as well. What what were the factors that impacted your race performance? It was just a question, and you could say anything. You you could say multiple things, right? You could say, ah, oh, well, my my hair was on fire, my shoelace came untied, and I took a wrong turn, and you know, it was just basically a bitch session. You know, if you want to think about that in in, in a research design, <laughs> and I and I use this a lot. I use this this uh this a lot. And I'll, I'll link the paper in uh, in the show notes. It's a, it's it's kind of a classic one in the specific specific table that we're looking at is is table five, where the respondents will where the respondents will come back and say, these are the things that limited my race performance. And I'm going to list them in in order and then divulge why we're talking about this in the strength training conversation, right? Yeah. So the, the problems that limited 
ultra marathon performance, according to both finishers and non finishers of the Western States 100 and the Vermont 100 are in order blisters or hot spots on feet with 40% of the finishers listing that as a problem, nausea and or vomiting 36%, muscle pain 36.5%, exhaustion 23%, inadequately heat acclimatized 21%, inadequately trained 13.5%, muscle, and we're gonna come back to inadequately trained by the way, 13.5%, okay. everybody remember that. <laughs> muscle cramping 11.4%, Injury during the race, nine. Ongoing injury, 7.5. Illness before the race, 6%. Started out too fast, 5%, so pacing error. Vision problems, 2.1%. Difficulty making cutoff times, 1.8%. Other not categorized, and this is the dog ate my homework, and I took a wrong turn, and you know I had I didn't have my peanut butter, my organic peanut butter oatmeal for breakfast or whatever, whatever other crybaby excuses Ken Clover would say people would come up with. But my, but my point with that, it, my point when I do this in presentations, this is why I'm so familiar with this chart, is that inadequately trained is kind of in the middle of the pack, right? 13.5% mm -hmm. of people are saying that the fact that they were inadequately trained is a reason that their race performance was impacted. And I look at that as a coach, I was like, you can train all this stuff. So somehow we're not communicating the fact that you the fact that you're getting nauseous or vomiting you can train that yeah. you're getting muscle pain Got you're inadequately trained if yep. you're exhausted you're inadequately trained if you are inadequately heat acclimatized you are also inadequately trained inadequately trained should be a hundred percent they should also mention that so I, yeah. anyway that's the context that i that i use this in presentation but my question for sarah since she's the strength training expert in the room is uh, in the room in the room, definitely in the room, all the rooms that I'm in, to be honest with you. <laughs> when we look at strength training from a performance perspective and how it impacts the factors that can impact race performance, right? The limiting factors for ultra marathon race performance. What specifically does strength training improve or alleviate amongst any of these or the ones that you can't think of that are in the other not categorized yeah, area. I don't know that's what, what athletes kind yeah. of come back to the performance piece, right? Yeah. They want to know how it's going to impact them. Yeah. So, I mean, I wish I knew what they considered the others to be. I'd love to just see that, <laughs> that list. <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah, who knows? Um, so you want me to point out which of these, I think strength training could have an impact and then we're going to pull them apart and you're going to tell no, me. I, I just think what's the fundamental proposition. Right. In, we well, you mentioned a lot of people would come out with injury that, prevention. A lot of people okay, would come there out we go. with, I mean, that's, that's probably one. the injury first prevention. one you expect me to say. Yeah. Yep. So injury prevention on here is kind of in the middle of the pack. 9% of finishers are saying injury and 10 during the race specifically, specifically and 10 not talking, of non-finishers. Yeah. Yep. 10%, 10% of non-finishers. Yeah. So to hundred percent agree with you that there might be some, some advantage strength training offers to not getting injured specifically during the race. Also, probably also there's a likelihood that strength training has an impact on overall training availability. Yep. And perhaps limiting injury during the training process. Well, and okay, the so missed that's, that's work, one. the missed training that you, like you said, you know, when you are injured and you're missing training, then you're less prepared for your event because you're missing training because you're injured. So yep. that kind of circles back. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. So what other race limiting factors do you think that strength training affects? Ongoing injury, potentially. If you're, you if you're mentioned that. Oh, oh I thought you meant injury. like yeah, injury yeah, during the race. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, ongoing injury, you mentioned that one. Okay. I wish I knew what muscle pain, what they were referring to, but I'm going to guess, are they referring to that more of like overtaxed muscles versus, yeah, I mean, I mean, any sort of strain earlier onset of i was gonna say doms <laughs> but that's not that's not true yeah uh, earlier I mean, onset of muscle soreness i mean everybody's had everybody's had that sensation who's run a mountainous ultra marathon where your legs just become dead towards the end the of it. This is just a, muscle pain right yeah. is is a more clinical way of saying i have dead legs yeah so, the, so is that one that you would say theoretically strength training could alleviate i know you're kind of 
You, those Theoretically. Of you that are not watching the YouTube video, Sarah's video, giving faces. Go back and watch, yeah, go back and watch Sarah's faces during this. Why the face? So, so that's important, actually. Why the face? Because we've had conversations about this and, and, and how, like, the loading for quads with downhill running when someone isn't able to run and train with lots of downhills and the dosage of that. We've had coaching calls with this and we've discussed this and we always come back to, we circle back where people always assume like, oh, do the strength training for it. And it's like, well, no, sometimes there's more specific things that people can do. So I think there could be some strength training benefits to some of that, but not all of it because the specificity of that muscle pain is probably their lack of being prepared for the course conditions and the actual loading of the course. And I'm not sure strength training in that case, I mean, that can you, it's blasphemous for me to say that, isn't it? No, it's not. I, I'm being that, honest. I actually think that that's spot on. I mean, yeah. you should be honest. We're talking to people that are going to take this advice and go to training with it. <laughs> well, I'm on, always now. honest. I don't, you know, uh, uh, but I, I mean, know. I feel like uh, people would always assume coming from me that I'm like strength training is it's, it's disingenuous to say strength training is going to cure all your woes. It doesn't take care of a lot of these, but it can take, it can potentially address some of them. Yeah, so that that's the that's the issue that I normally have with people say, well, you know, if you have dead legs at the end of the race, you should just squat more. That's not and, specific. Right. So, yes, that can be part of the intervention that you're using. That's probably a very light hammer, meaning it makes maybe a tiny teeny tiny bit of difference yeah. in that problem. Your bigger difference is go run downhill. Yeah. Like, and it could be too, like earlier in the season, if you're able to do heavier weights and you're working on force production and the things like that can then prime your, your, your body so that you're stronger during the runs that come later, but the actual in season strength training, you're better served. And this comes back to kind of in the beginning of the specificity of your training. And you've got to make sure you're hitting the running first before you start adding is the ultra running going to enhance what you already can do. Yeah. It's not an so in maybe, place of, it's not an exchange of. That's a brilliant way to put it. It's not in place of, and I would, I, you know me, I always like to rack and stack things. So are my faces me. worth it? <laughs> that's <laughs> totally worth it because if you make a sour face, I'm like, I'm ranking that low. If you get like the, yes, with a huge smile on your face, I'm like, okay, I'm going to rank it a little higher because yeah. Sarah has a good reaction to it. <laughs> okay. So, but, so mu muscle pain probably, you know, let's, huh, there could be. I mean, it could be me. Yeah. Training's more important. Way Training's more important. important. Yeah. Handable Nausea important. and vomiting. I don't not, think not so much blisters or hot spots on feet. I mean, you can train barefoot, but that's not, it's not going to do the yeah. same as, you know, what about muscle cramping? Cause I have heard this in the training and in the coaching world, yeah. strength train so that your muscles don't cramp. Well, is our cramping coming from that or an inadequate hydration and electrolytes and fueling? Or just bad training or just bad training, which <laughs> or is just being inadequately trained. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wish, I wish it could be, I mean, we could say that there could be some potential again, I'm saying some, because I don't know yeah. the numbers here, but mm -hmm. I think good training is probably going to take care of more of that. You're not going to be out on the hundred mile course going, damn, I wish I did more squats. My legs are cramping. Mm. Probably not. Put it. It's probably not why that's happening. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, yeah. So, uh, and I, th I think the way, I think the way I, in terms of this research, I think the way that that would come out is what you don't see is muscle strength, right? You don't see, you don't see the, like the problem, which is the first column, right? Yep. In this table, blisters, nausea, muscle pain, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Inadequate muscle strength yeah. is not a problem that people are citing as an, as a limiting factor or something that impacts their race performance. Now, whether it is or not is a different question. They're not bringing, they're not citing it. It's not something they're not, that they're coming out with and saying, yeah. Yeah, and to your point, they're not in the middle of the Western States cor course going, damn it, I wish I would have done more squats. <laughs> If somebody's ever said that, I would have beat that person. <laughs> I'm not going to rule it out. Yeah. But I don't think that that's a common, I don't think that that's a common, uh, kind of a common saying. The, so the reason I bring this up for banter at the end is to bring to light something that you just mentioned, Sarah, is that it's not going to cure all, all of your woes. And you have to be, we have to be very cautious with where we place it in 
the context of all of this performance. Yes, we can be advocates for it. Yes, we can think it, you know, makes a big difference in your life and things like that. But let's not oversell what yeah. is actually going on here from a performance perspective. And that's the key. If it's for the health benefits, the pure enjoyment, the satisfaction, I won't argue any of those. But if it's the yeah. performance aspect of ultra marathoning, then we have we can't don't make it more than it is. It's not the Perfect. cure-all. So quality training will will win over every day of Perfect. Like, okay. Yeah. We, we can put a pin in that banter. I think that's perfect. What did I tell us to come back to? I already forgot. Oh gosh, I have go. it on my notes. Hold on. <laughs> this is what happens when you go off the cuff. No, I have uh, to rely on the guests to bring you. Seriously. To bring you back on the rails. Oh, wait. Oh, detrimental to training. I have that. Oh, we already talked about that. We already okay, talked about perfect. that. We're good. Okay, yeah. Good. See? We're good. Look at you us. You guys can stop listening. <laughs> Sarah, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me uh, on. Since since you just changed your social media profile, you might as well give it to everybody so they can give you a follow. What is it? Oh, it's the same name. It's just a different picture. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's a pretty yeah. different picture. Oh, oh, um, dirty runner, D R T Y runner, is on Instagram and the twit the tweeters, but I don't tweet very often. So <laughs> yeah, I always got confused because her profile picture was upside down, and now it's while. right side up. That's our rounds right side up. I'm not going to recognize her. Go give Sarah a follow. Sarah, thank you for everything that you're doing for your athletes, but also for our coaching department. I can't wait to see and unwrap that gift oh. that we've been trying for so many years so long. to get on the right. I uh, know it's something I couldn't solve. I, 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 I definitely left that on the table. But <laughs> I think we'll, I think we'll crack that code eventually for sure. So I hope so prematurely. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Sarah for coming on the podcast today and indulging me in some of the rabbit holes that we went down. We can only plan for those these things so much. And it seems like 20% of the outline goes to plan and then the rest of the 80% is just whatever we want to talk about. And I know Coach Sarah is always game for that because she is an absolutely fantastic coach. We're proud to have her as a coaching colleague at CTS. This episode of the podcast was largely a result of a lot of the questions that I get on social media, Sarah gets on social media, as well as we both get out in the field. And so in that vein, you all have the opportunity to record a question that will be played back live in a future episode of the Coopcast. If you happen to be out at February's Black Canyon 100K, I will be out there supporting a number of CTS athletes and I will bring along my mobile recording studio. I'm gonna set it up in the van at the aid stations. All you have to do is pop your head in, close the door, hit the record button, record your question, and I will filter through them and answer them on a future episode of the Coopcast. I would love to see if any of you all are out there. I absolutely get tickled whenever I get to meet athletes out in the field that are listeners to the podcast or just happen to be fans of the book. It brings a lot of joy to my life and there's always something that everybody wants answered. So if you're out of the Black Canyons 100K, go look for my van. It's pretty easy to spot. Pop your head in, record a question. I'd love to hear from you. If you're not out of the Black Canyon 100K, hey, I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of the listeners out there. You can always share this episode of the podcast on uh, with your friends and with your family and with all of your training partners. It means a lot to me personally. That is it for today, for this episode of the Coopcast. As always, folks, we will see you out on the trails.